until I left. Um, so I went to work for AdTrans. Um, I did a lot, to, as Louise said, I, I was part of the team that won the first big sort of direct contract with um, a train operator with Great Western. But the, the two things that really stick out in my mind and memory in those, those seven years uh, was the, the engine the relationship that we built on the left there with the GNR. The, we put in a brand new maintenance regime for the engines and we improved the performance of the engines substantially. Um, and on the right, uh, I had the pleasure to be involved in Delta 91, which, uh, which was the, re the reworking of the, uh, the Class 91 locos. And uh, I got involved with the supply chain and with the, uh, with the service support. We, we created Doncaster as a service support function for East Coast, uh, for GNER. That, that relationship got a lot of work into the business. We also did the rewiring and the, and the rebuild of the power cars as well, plus a, a big increase in sort of un, unscheduled work. So that, that, that was when I really first got into big programs and that built up a bit of an appetite. Unfortunately, uh, the factory was sucked in 2004, so I was made redundant. Um, so I went, I went to Filey one day to, to go and, to go and uh, stay with my mother and I got a phone call to, uh, to come and work for GNER. So I swapped sides. So the relationships I've built over the last four years, I joined GNER. And again, GNER, I, I worked for Jerry McFadden um, on GNER2, the franchise. I built a wheel lathe at Bounds Green, uh, which we'll come back to later. And, and the, again, the one we did a lot of things at um, GNER in those, those years and, 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 and beyond. And, and the one thing that we really did work hard on is, was, the, was the MTU project and the refurbishment of the HST fleet. And that brought to uh, world-class performance in terms of the fleet and, and the insides of the train and, and all the challenges that we had with that. And, and that again was, you know, a great program to be involved in. So again, the, the, the sort of, um, the, the sort of idea of working in program management going forward really was starting to instill into my head. And, and, and I was thinking, do I really want to be in um, logistics and materials for the rest of my career? So, um, you know, and, and the, the GNER fleet became the Virgin fleet, and we, we we won the gold. You know, the team won the Golden Spanner, and it very was very much was a team effort led by the guys up at Craig and Tinney. Um, but it, but um, great efforts, and we did a lot of work on things like bogies. So, um, Louise, I, I noticed your comments around Maximo. Um, <laughs> so in the 2011, I became program manager on what was called Project Eagle, which was the introduction of Maximo across the, 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 through, through the East Coast depots, by which point we were East Coast, uh, government owned, how ironic. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we, we, we introduced Maximo, we had a lot of success, we had a lot of challenges, um, working with people who uh, we were basically changing their way of working that they had for years. And, and again, you know, three years of hard work and, and we bought a lot of apprentices into the project younger people into the project who are now senior people within the industry and it's great to see how people have come through that program and project and developed into the people that they are now so at the end of the project um steve Rowlo, i think spoke to you recently um who was head of quality compliance said to me what, what do you want to do next i said well, i don't really want to go and sit in york um there's not a lot of program work going on at the moment so he said well why don't you go and be the um quality and compliance manager at Bounds Green. So I spent two years commuting up and down on NL65 to, uh, to Bounds Green and, and worked with a great team down there. And we did a, we did a, you know, basically, I mean, people used to complain we were changing so much, but we, 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 we changed a lot of the ways of working. It was a, a challenging depot to work with. You know, we'd put Maximo in, we were starting to use Maximo as a, as a, as a, as a, a way of working, a way of managing the fleet integrating the wheel lathe into the main maintenance program and, and uh, working with Wabtec and people like that. Um, you know, and I learned a lot um, in, in, that, in that role. And um, then in 2016, and I'd, I'd actually been um, um, offered, not offered the job in 2011, but I wanted to go into the program. I was given the chance to, to go to York to run the maintenance control, which was a, which was a great honor. You know, I started out as a procurement uh, person and, to actually end up end up running the maintenance control in York and following the footsteps of lots of great people was a real honour, and Virgin now was really stamping its product onto the East Coast in terms of every train must have everything working. You know, all the boilers must work. We challenged um, things like trains coming out of Wabtec and putting them straight into service rather than going back to Bounds Green, and we introduced a whole new way of planning and a lot more detail in terms of getting trains back to depots. 
Um, a part of that work was managing the interface with the depots, and that's me up at Inverness on my last week with Virgin. Um, so I managed the contracts with Neville Hill Heat and Inverness and Pomody, um, which was a great, you know, it, it was all around managing the, the, the sort of workload. We moved work from Bounds Green to Heaton. So, yeah, so I was, I was, it was probably the best job I ever had. And, and I didn't want to leave, but um, I was working towards moving to Itachi, which is probably if I'd have stayed there where I would have gone. Um, but I was made an offer to, uh, in 2017, to go and join Northern. So, um, which was really bizarre in a way. So you'd come from the Virgin group of companies with all the Razamatas and the Virgin Way and, 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 all, and all that. And you go to Northern, that's a year into a new franchise um, and a year into uh, an operation with a one billion pound investment program in a company that up to 2016 scratched and saved every penny it could. You know, um, you know it had no, um, no investment whatsoever. And, and to come there and, um, and and to work with the guys at Northern, they, they were sort of a bit, um, when I turned up, not suspicious of me, but uh, there were two or three of us who, who turned up. And Nick Donovan was the engineering director at the time before Ben Ackroyd joined and Alan Chaplin was the programme director, who I knew from my days at Unipart. So, you know, it was, it was a great team to work with. Nick, of course, is now the MD, so we, we'll come back to that in a bit. So this was on the left there, you can see is the, the sort of strap line that we had in um, 2016. Um, you know, refurbishing the trains, um, extra seats, bringing in the new trains in 2018, Wi-Fi, and really growing the network. Um, and we all know what's happened in the last year or so, but certainly, you know, there's still our aspiration to do that. So these are some of the other projects that I've, I've led over the last... Um, so I joined as Rolling Stock Programme Manager. Um, I became head, head of en Engineering Transformation in December 2017. Um, and then I took over the new trains project as well when Ian Hyde left to go to join Hitchilton as engineering director. So, um, so these are the programs that we've been doing. And if you travel around on our network today, when you can travel, um, you know, you'll get onto trains now, 35 year old trains with Wi-Fi, with refurbished trains. We finished the refurb project off a couple of weeks ago at Crew. And the other really interesting project is Flex. So that is a Flex train at um, Ashton uh, in Manchester. Uh, on a test run at Mars Platting Bank just to prove that we could get up the bank. Um, we're planning to introduce those chains in May. We did a very successful trial run yesterday between Wigan and Liverpool to, to just test some, some theories. So, you know, we're moving towards introducing uh, bi-mode technology into the UK and the way forward. So um, just to give you um, a bit of a background about Northern, for those that don't know, um, it's, it's uh, a rather large area of the north of England. Um, when you, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, I've, I've been used to traveling, you know, I work for Intercity, I work for East Coast, you know, you were used to traveling to do your job, but Northern was something else. Um, so one of the first things I did when I joined, they were running a, a program called Proud to be Northern, which was, um, which was about uh, going out uh, and, and communicating with the people on the ground uh, about all our plans, whether it was ticketing, uniforms, stations, trains, everything that we were planning to do over the next, uh, the next four, well, the, at that time, over the next nine years, um, 2016 through to 2025, which was the length. Of so the first thing I did was um, I went to Barrow. And uh, at the time, you know, there's me, you know, didn't know a lot of people at the time. We were operating the Class 37s on the Cambrian coast, not very well. Sorry, Cumbrian coast, not very well. Loads of problems, not very happy crews, crews on the ground. A, a real challenging area. We had ex-TPE drivers and ex-Northern drivers all on different terms and conditions. But we had a good depot. And, and the one thing I've always learned, and it goes back to my days at Plymouth, the, the outstations are so important. So you look at places like Barrow, Penzance, you know, these outstations, if they work well, and you look at the investment Penzance has got now, you know, it, it really is so important to us to manage these outstations. So over the first three months, I went to Barrow, Blackpool, Carlisle, Hull, um, Sheffield, Preston, you know, just to meet people and just to get to. The first one I did in Leeds, I got absolutely casticated over the, uh, the refurbishing programme. We'd just done the first train and one of the depot guys who's now one of my team gave me a right to uh, telling off about the, the state of the train and, and then everything else. So, so yeah, so... Uh, that's Northern, um, give you an overview of the, the main depots from an engineering perspective. Um, so in the north, Northeast, we've got Heaton. Um, obviously some people on here will know that we do a lot of work for, for LNER, Hitachi and TPE. 
Uh, it's got two fleets now, 156s, 158s. Uh, both fleets are now refurbished and we're now looking to grow the, 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 the work into the, the Wi-Fi program up there. Biggest challenge in the, in the Northeast is the heating fleets, particularly the 158s, work a long way away from their core depot. So you can find the 158s, for example, in Sheffield or Nottingham. So, you know, the way the diagrams work, it's, it's a big challenge. So, again, we're doing a lot of work about how we manage that in the future. Um, moving down to Neville Hill, uh, which a lot of you know very well on the call. Um, it's jointly operated by Northern and East Midlands Railways, who the EMR maintain the trains for themselves and the LNR and the Cross Country. Our facility was opened in 1958 uh, with a wheel lathe maintenance unit on the site. Uh, the site is currently in the process of being assessed for long-term requirements as the, the fleet provision in the Leeds area will change over the next 20 years. Without doubt, there will be a lot more electric trains in, in the area. If you look at Transpanine route upgrade, if you look at the network rail carbonisation plan, um, you know, the, 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 the plan is that certainly sort of Sheffield, Nottingham, Doncaster, Leeds, York will all be electrified. Uh, so Neville Hill is a key site to manage that going forward. So we need to take the opportunity to, to not just look at things that we need to do over the next six months, but things that we need to do over the next six years. And the 170 fleet was a, 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 an ironic thing when I got involved with Neville Hill because I introduced 170s up in Scotdale. And um, so we have 16 170s now that work uh, the Harrogate line, but more importantly work the Sheffield Hull line, which originally was going to be a 195 operated railway. But because of the capabilities of the 170s, three car trains, we've modernised them and we've, we've made them into a train. And with a lot of our fleet refurb feedback is the 170 fleet is the best refurb that we've done. Um, and it works up to, uh, to, to uh, Nafferton International Parkway up to uh, Scarborough. So, uh, you know, the, the train fleet there is, uh, is, 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 as we can see there. Um, West region, um, Allerton. So Allerton was rebuilt in 2011 from a very rundown freight maintenance facility. Uh, it facilitated the introduction of the Northern Electric Services uh, into the Western Central region with the 319s. Um, which came up from London in the right state and it took us probably about three years, four years to get them working properly and they're now disappearing. Um, we've got a wheel lathe there, but we, we did a lot of work in 2019 to upgrade the maintenance unit uh, with a bogey chop pit and an overhead gantry system so we can maintain the 331 fleet. And with Allerton, we've got outstations at Blackpool and Barrow, which we're now investing um, a lot of money. I mean, the team at Blackpool, are ex, a lot of them are ex Alston guys from Preston, so they, they know all about electric trains. So, you know, we're now... We, you know, we've spent a lot of money there and we're now spending a lot of time and effort in, in really improving the fleet. And finally, um, and I've picked Newton Heath last because we're talking about the 195s. Um, really interesting thing is, and Jack Commander, who start, when he started his engineering, says all these depots are opened in 1876, which if you go into the history books, they all were, all the main depots. Um, and, and the maintenance facility, at Newton Heath, it's still the old steam shed. Uh, and it was only really modified for diesel operations during the 1980s when the paces and the sprinters were introduced. Um, it's the heavy maintenance base of the 150, 156 units. We're just opening a brand new fleet maintenance facility for the 195 fleet, which I'll come back to later on. And we've introduced and implemented a wheel lathe there. And certainly with new trains and, and sort of midlife tire turning, having a wheel lathe on site, so we'll now have wheel laves at Allerton, Newton Heath and Neville Hill. Interestingly, I don't know whether people know, but the wheel lave at um, Newton Heath is, actually came from Old Oak Common. So uh, when Old Oak Common was closed, we bought the wheel lave, which was around eight years old, uh, which was in the old maintenance shed there. We brought that up to uh, Newton Heath. We, we rebuilt what was the, um, the paint facility, but, um, but knocked a big hole in and uh, off we went and... Um, and, and, and introduced it there and is supported by the outstations maintenance facilities in Blackburn and Wigan, both of which are brand new. Um, they're on old railway land at uh, Blackburn is the old coal yard and Wigan is at the back end of what was Wigan Springs Ranch. But again, big investment by the business to, uh, to maintain the trains. So that's, uh, that's Northern. So we'll now, uh, um, we'll now move to the, the star of the show. I can't hear you laughing. Um, so you can't you can't uh, talk about the 195 fleet without talking about the uh, the Pacers. So um, the Pacers, um, obviously, uh, in in the in the Eureka franchise, it was written in that 
any unit with a single axle must be out of the business by 2019 and replaced by new trains. So it was actually a designated um, committed obligation in the franchise. These trains are still in service to the north of England, but um, they, uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, when you join Northern, you know, having come from East Coast, where both fleets had had a hell of a lot of investment over the years, and you suddenly walk into uh, uh, Sheffield Station to catch a patient to go to Manchester, um, or you go up the East Coast Main Line and a halt to York service at 70 mile an hour as the Mark IV's coming towards you, 125 at um, Hamilton. Um, you suddenly realise you, you sort of penny dropped. Um, this is why we're uh, we're doing what we're doing. So you can see here uh, we we retired the places in 2020, uh, which was uh, a year later than planned. And, and the biggest challenge was, which we'll come to in a minute, was the whole impact of COVID in 2020 because we were planning. We actually took them out of service in December uh, 19. We held them. We held 20 units in storage at Heat and pending any issues that we may have it was a contingency plan and lo and behold covid kicked in and the driver training program was stopped so we had to reintroduce the paces back into service in the july timetable 2020 to, to basically provide trains for people to, to to get get around go to school whatever in in the, in the manchester area so you know great servants but um now gone, we have none on the patch. The last three left heat and a couple of weeks ago, we stripped some seats out at the weekend for one of the preservation societies. And you may have seen, if you live in the north of England, a pacer actually was delivered to school, to a school through Portable on Wednesday to be used as a classroom. So they're all, a number of them have moved to preservation railways, you know, but you know, it's time to move on. So, okay, so <clears throat> the class 195 fleet, um, and our project team, fine, fine group of people there on the right. Um, so um, came into the uh, business in uh, 2017. And you've got to remember that the class 195 was actually not ordered by Northern. It was ordered by Arriva uh, as part of their franchise. So nobody within the Northern business had any involvement whatsoever with the uh, class 195s in terms of their concept, their design, their maintenance, where they were going to be based, how they were going to be commissioned, all, the, all through the whole process of, of build to delivery to service. So we had to create a project team. So um, Ian and I joined from Cross Country uh, and Arriva Sister Company as, as head of new trains and, and started to create the project team. And we, we were pretty clear that there was some really good support from, from people like Duncan Shaw in terms of the, you know, come from that team. But we wanted to own this this whole project within Northern. You know, Alan Chaplin and Ben were very clear that, and Nick were very clear that we we had to own this. So into the project team came a couple of guys who were apprentices had come through the ranks at Newton Heath. Um, we, a guy from Allerton who was an engineering supervisor, a station fitter from Manchester Piccadilly, uh, tech guy from Newcastle. Um, uh, guys from the, the operational teams came involved, uh, the drivers, which we'll come to in a bit. So we created, uh, and, and of course, Gary Tremble, who, who this week is retiring from Northern um, after 40 years, um, was, was instrumental in, um, in that whole design and, and team. So, and in fact, somebody commented on his, on his leaving card or whatever, it's not a card these days, it's all on the internet. I joined the business in 2016 and, and you were head of engineering, but I didn't know you existed because you were in Spain all the time. Um, so, um, you know, we set up our project team. They weren't the Romans, but um, we had to deal with, you know, we had to create relationships with CAF and CAF are uh, a mixture of Catalans and Basques um, and also with the team in, um, in Evershell. So we, we had to create a strong relationship working with different cultures and different ways of business. We, we had never worked in an environment like that. You know, we'd had CAF trains in the past with the uh, Treble Threes, but that was 20 years ago and, and people were not used to working in these environments. So we created the project team we got the structure up and running. We put the project reporting in place. Um, we created all the, uh, the, sort of, the, the sort of contract management with, with Evershell through a system called the Conics. And off we went. So what I'm going to do now is take you through the process from, um, from design through to, uh, to, to build and into service. And then we'll talk about how the fleet is now performing uh, and what the challenges are uh, as we take the fleet forward. So this, the 195s is not a new train. Fundamentally, it's, um, the, the 195 is a derivative of the Irish Rail DMU that CAF built a number of years ago. And, and Northern Ireland Railways were really useful um, 
uh, company for us to work with and do sort of uh, undertake our checks and balances when we started the project. And fundamentally, the train there, the engine, the bogies, the, the layout, the, the build of the train is the same. The differences are the, the systems on the train, the cab, the uh, and, and, and some of the operational safety systems. But, but Northern Ireland Rivers were a really good check and balance for us in terms of their experience with CAF, our arrangement with CAF and their arrangement with CAF from a maintenance perspective was the same. It was a TSSSA technical spares and support contract. Uh, we, we maintain the trains, they maintain the trains. So we spent a lot of time with the guys over there and they were a great help to us. And, you know, the, we've, there was a lot of lessons learned from us. So you can see here the specifications of the train. I'm not going to read them out in detail. You, you know, the presentation will be shared, but, um, you know, MTU engine that, uh, that was already in use in the UK on the class 172s. The transmission was in use in the UK. Um, you know, we, we had a train that, you know, with the acceleration that it's got and the ride that, it, you know, the, 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 the challenges of where we're going to use it. So um, the design process started in January 2016 before we as Northern became a river Northern. So um, we quickly had to get involved with the design process, get involved with the design reviews and a number of the guys who were mentioned earlier. Um, so people like Sam Taylor, Gary, Gary Kane, Gary Tremble, Gary Barty, um, spent a lot of time, Ian Hyde spent a lot of time in Spain in the factories, um, getting involved in the design and signing the design packs off with the team in Evershaw, with Shaka, Shaka Ismail and, 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 and the guys from there. So, um, you know, we, we created a really, you know, good, strong relationship with the guys at CAF, Eduardo, who's the project manager, um, the design guys on the ground. And, and you, know, it, it, you know, we'll come back to that later in terms of how that's developed as we went along. So a big thing for us was the cab. Um, we already had a strong, uh, what we call cab improvement group with the, with, the, with the ASLEF health and safety reps and the industrial reps. Uh, we're currently doing quite a bit of work on the cabs on the older fleets. And we wanted to cement that relationship into the new train fleet. Because as you can see here, if I was going to put a picture of a pacer up here, but I didn't get around to it. If, if you think, or if you think of a 150, which is basically uh, a, a a seat that's on the that's uh, bolted to the back of the door uh, with a set of controls. TPWS or GSMR is probably the most advanced piece of kit that we've got on those trains. Single foot, single window, left hand side drive, gangways. You know, so here was an opportunity to create a completely new environment for the drivers. So we worked very hard with the industrial reps, some of whom eventually became our test drivers. So we've had people from the from the sort of Aslef community and driver community in the northern who have been involved right from day one right through to putting the trains into service um, and you can see the cab there and it, good for me is the seat in the middle is the same seat that we installed on the journey RHST power cars the move seat um, which we had issues when, when we first um, installed them so again there was a link back to where I'd come before to uh, to this project so that was that was a good benchmark and you can see all the screens in there you know these trains are fitted for various modes of operation um you can see uh, there's the, the screen that's got the uh, uh writing on the middle there is is the driver advisory system uh which we we haven't got in use yet but i think you with these types of things you've got to take them slowly and add things in slowly so um, we'll come back to some of the systems later so you know signing that cab off we've got a full mock-up of this cab it's actually sat in sat, sat in scunthorpe at panasonic's place um, we've got a full mock-up of this cab and we played a lot with where things should be and, and how it would work. But in the main, uh, the feedback is very good from the drivers that have driven these trains over the last few years. The only thing they don't like is just to the right of the picture behind you is the second man seat and the, um, the instructors don't like that seat at all. They say the vision's not very good. So that's something we need to do with. But to be fair, um, and I think the only other thing we've had since we've been into service, and, and which is a great compliment to the people who worked on it, is, is the AWS sounders. We had some issues with the noise on the AWS sounders. So we worked with CAF and, 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 and again with the reps and we tested a new sounder. Um, it was very similar to the uh, to another sounding. There's a lot more alerts coming off in this cab. So, uh, um, you know, and we had a TCMS system on this cab, which gave us, you know, level one alerts, level two alerts. And again, we'd worked with the reps to, agree which alerts you're going to see on the screens and when you go into service you have to change those alerts as you go along so uh, 
that that was a, that was a successful piece of work, and it's still something that everybody's really proud of in terms of the cabs now. Um, so production. Uh, so we started around July 2017. So the DMUs were built in uh, Iran, in Spain. The bogies were supplied from Bazine in Spain, and the body shells were supplied from Zaragoza in Spain. Uh, it's a bit like Derby Lecture Slane, but a bit warmer. Um, they, uh, um, the, whilst the MUs were all built at Zaragoza. So the DMUs were built in Spain. Um, the, all the three cars, no, that's not correct. Um, 30 of the three cars were built in Spain, and I think from memory, 16 or 17 of the two cars. Don't quote me on that. Um, and then um, CAF approached us uh, uh, sort of halfway through the build cycle and said, we're going to open this new factory at Newport in Wales. Um, we'd like to build some of our trains, some of your trains there. It would be good for the UK economy. So on the right there, you can see... Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the last unit that came off the Newport. And the, the biggest thing that struck me that day, and was, it, was, it was about three weeks before the pandemic started, was Prince Charles opened the facility. And the investment in, in apprentices there was awesome. And some of those apprentices that came into the factory are now, now working within the CAF maintenance teams and technical support teams out on the route. So, you know, talking to the guys that day and the girls that day was, was really important because they wanted to know how their trains were going to work and how they were working at the time. So. You know, so so that's the production. Um, you know, the, these things, like everything else now, is that's why I joke about Litchurch Lane. You go to these sites now, and they're all built very similar, all built along the Toyo to build techniques. You know, you start off with some metal, and you end up with a body, you end up with a body shell, and then you turn it over, and you put all the underframe on, and then you add the bogies, and then you add the electronics, and the and you know, it's all the same wherever you go. And there's a lot of the guys down at Newport to the next Bombardier in Derby the, the, who, who set it up. So, you know, so um, as I say, a number of the two cars were built there. And the last, we ordered um, three additional three car units for the Windermere line. The centre cars were built in Spain, but the outer cars were constructed in um, in Newport. So, um, you know, we've got a mix of trains. We, we, we had a big concern at the time that we would end up with different build types. So we actually created a task force to make sure that was going to wasn't going to happen. Um, and if you look at the reliability figures or the performance figures, th there's no difference between the builds and, and where they were built. So, so that was um, 2017. Um, May 2018, a, a year on, uh, we moved to, to start the testing process. Uh, the, the units were tested in the factories. And then we moved uh, a couple of three car, the Czech Republic by ship um, to undertake uh, the, the first um, trials of high-speed testing, braking, um, and on-train systems. So again, the project team, Sam Taylor, Gary Tremble, people like that moved to Spain, so sort of followed the, the build around um, and were involved in the testing uh, of the trains. Um, and it was there, and I think just partly after we found probably the first big issue that we had, we had some issues with couplers, inter-vehicle couplers on uh, specific track geometry, very sharp curves, particularly in depots. So um, we actually had to stop the build program for about two months um, whilst we resolved that issue. Um, so it proves, despite all the work in the design, you can still find something wrong as you go along. Um, but um, so yeah, so um, we did all the type testing out there in uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, as you know, the the Welsh government are investing in a similar facility in Wales now. So that's great to see for the future for for you know, if we get more trains in the UK, that would be a good place to go. Um, although I think some people would rather go to Czech Republic than uh, the, the, the Welsh Valleys, but uh, that's another story. So then from May 18, uh, we, we did all the testing and, and then we, we, uh, we started to create the commissioning. So one of the biggest challenges was Arriva signed the contract, which said the commissioning would be undertaken at one of Northern depots. Northern depots are not set up to commission trains. Um, you, you can't commission units whilst you're also trying to run a depot. So no real analysis had been done of, you know, bringing units in and out of Newton Heath or Allerton. Uh, and the fact that you couldn't actually bring a unit out, in and out for those that know Allerton depot, you can't bring a, lo a loader in and out of the depot. So that was a no-go because these trains were coming from Spain on the, through ships and then being put on low loaders and brought to the north of England. So there was a whole series of complications. So just as I joined the company and in, in sort of, March, March, April 17, we had a long debate about how or where we could find a commissioning site. 
And um, to some chance conversations, we we uh, we came up with Edge Hill, and of course Edge Hill had been uh, modified heavily to undertake the uh, the lengthening of the Pendolinos to eleven cars, so it was a perfect facility and and had two um, two roads that that weren't used regularly for servicing and were basically empty. So uh, we uh, we 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 commissioned we 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 arranged a contract with with Alstom. Uh, and so the units were brought to Edge Hill. We could bring them in by road. Uh, we could unload them. We could form them up and then do, do the initial power testing. So um, we then had this, the next challenge was how we're we going to do the fault free running. So, you know, um, again, you could use, you could go out to your ROGs or your freight liners or whoever to do your fault free running. But we said, um, certainly Ian Hyde and the team said, well, no, I'd actually like some of our people to do the fault free running testing. So we formed a, a group of drivers um, who basically uh, for the next uh, two to three years commissioned the trains. Um, so uh, you can see at the top there, uh, we finished the last one off a couple of weeks ago. So three, three Zulu 50 became a sort of panda amount of, of watching every day to see that the, the commissioning trial run had worked. Um, and, and once the train's been commissioned, uh, we then uh, undertake final acceptance. So the, you go to factory acceptance and then uh, qualified factory acceptance, provisional acceptance, and we'll come back to final acceptance later. So basically Northern then accept the unit uh, with pre some preconditions, but basically the unit has done its fault free running. We reset the clock on some units, not that many. Um, ironically, this unit, we had to reset the clock because we had an alternator fault. Um, so we managed that process ourselves. So 195107 was the first unit to be accepted in December 2018. So two years on from starting the process, we accepted a unit. Um, and that then went into our maintenance and training, um, operational training plan. Um, I'm not showing you too much on the right hand corner, but one of the challenges had, we actually derailed the unit quite badly at, um, in Alstom, 100 mark. 100 miles before it was due to be accepted and three days before the Arima franchise finished. So uh, <laughs> that was an interesting uh, discussion with lawyers and, and various other people, but um, that became the last unit. So we actually, uh, we accepted the last of the three cars in December last year, and then we accepted the last uh, 195021. And two of the drivers at the back there, Craig and Steve, were part of the original uh, team. And Craig now is uh, doing some work with us on, on type testing flex as well. So we had the same guys, went out every day, knew the units, really good relationship built with CAF on site. Uh, we Pete Jablonski and the team there and the Alstom guys, and, and we created a really good, and, and Gary Barty managed it as the site commissioning manager. Um, and again, everybody's learned a lot from this and, and, and created really good team spirits. And then the, the Evershot guys with us, so that worked well. So um, here we go. We've now got some trains. Uh, we now want to put them into service. So in the autumn of 2018, we started the whole process of working towards a, a service introduction in the spring of 2019. So um, in overall, we trained 1,200 conductors and 2,000 drivers. Um, you can see some of the drivers there at Doncaster with a 331. And the principle was you, you, you were primarily trained in one of the unit types and then secondary trained in the other. So you were primarily trained on a 331 and then you were secondary trained on the 195. From a driving point of view and controls, they were fundamentally the same. The differences was obviously the, the type of traction, um, you know. So, so uh, we we trained those drivers at the, at the same time. Northern was bringing in a lot of new drivers into the business um, to to create the, the the additional services that I talked about earlier. But we didn't just train drivers. We 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 had to um, really get to grips with how we were going to de deploy these trains. Um, you can't just um, deploy trains onto the network, as many people on this call will know, there's lots of challenges and I'll come to a couple more in a minute. So we created these dependency maps, um, which we call the scripts. And it, and it, <clears throat> it started off with the function saying, um, this is what I had to do to, um, to, to, to plan the trains into the service. So the infrastructure work we needed to do, the training resource that we needed to train the guys, the train plan in terms of when they will be introduced, what diagrams they would work on, how we will take the older trains out of the network and bring the new ones in. And then um, the fleet requirements led by Ian Hyde in terms of managing the new trains in and Mick Green managing the older trains out and cascading the units around or removing the paces uh, from service and the 32X trains as well, the 321s, 322s. So 
it went, you know, what started in autumn 18, we had a, a sort of go, no go session in about April 2019. And we decided to go for it uh, for July 2019. Um, and that went down to, we put 20 trains in that week, that weekend, but we didn't do it over the weekend. We did it a week before. So every day a new train started running and an old train came out or went somewhere else. Um, the example I was using is the December 2019 one at Sheffield, where we basically every night a pacer went to work, stopped for storage, and a, and a new 1952 car came over from Newton Heath and went into service. Um, and that, to, to be fair, and a credit to everybody and the whole programme management team through, 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 uh, through Alan and Emma and Sue Essery, we, we created a, a way of doing it. And we were talking about it this afternoon because we're coming up to timetable changes now. And we, the relationship that was built right across the functions, everybody working towards a common goal that we will deliver this, this change into the business. Um, we know it's going to be a challenge, but we will do it. And we had all the risks and issues. So, you know, we started with that and that became a way of working with the Northern. That, and a lot of that came out of the experience of May 18. There's no doubt about that. Um, the challenges have been given 10 weeks to completely rework your train plan because the wires on the Bolton corridor weren't been delivered. Um, but, that, that taught us a lot in terms of planning and really get into the detail of the, the planning and the way of working and the, and the way we introduce change. So there were two things really that, uh, that two massively hugely important projects that we undertook to support the introduction of the trains. Um, the first one was gauging and it didn't just apply at the time to introducing the new trains. As I said earlier, we, we were moving the existing trains uh, around the network to work so like, like the 158s going up to the northeast um, to work on the Sunderland line uh, the the 170s coming in originally to go to Southport but then to go to Holden Scarborough um, and 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 the 150s you know if you go to South Yorkshire now what were the pace of trains are now worked by 150 so ev every railway every part of the railway had some change on that map that I showed you earlier had some change in terms of what change you were using and where so working with Network Rail and the clear, clear route system, we identified the 460 gauging fouls, 250 gauging fouls that, that were removed following site verifications. And those site verifications in some ways was actually running trains around the, so I remember doing the 171 between Harrogate and Leeds and, and if anybody knows Starbeck, we were thinking, oh, it's not gonna fit there, but it, it worked perfectly. And 149 gauging fouls were removed following infrastructure work. And one of the biggest challenges there, and I can't remember the name of the tunnel, there's a tunnel on the Calder Valley line uh, between Todmorden and uh, Walsden and, and Rochdale. And the canal runs um, alongside it and runs underneath it as you go into the tunnel. So literally, when you look at it, you couldn't do anything to the infrastructure. And the gauge clearance computer basically said you've got a foul of about uh, three centimetres. Um, but what it didn't know is that we done some track work there and put better track and reduced the... Um, the track base slightly so we actually went to site measured it out one weekend during a possession and proved that we could run the train and there was a massive sigh of relief because basically everybody said we won't be able to run the 195s between manchester and leeds which is one of their core routes now so um that that uh, so you can see the, the the fleets that we've we've had to do the gauging work on and uh, wayne cockrell and, and his team pete dunn absolutely superb piece of work and again um you know, we'll come back to the maintenance depot in a bit like the commissioning I talked about. The, none of this was assessed in terms of part of the project. So this was where we had to go back to the business and get extra cash to go and do this kind of work. And, you know, again, you know, the challenge of introducing these trains onto a network without involving the operator at the time, it, you know, you, you, you know, we just got on with it because we had to do it. We didn't have any choice. The other big piece of work was as the validation, so automatic selected door opening, completely new to Northern. Never, never, ever had any any systems like this before, any of the trains and platform training testing. So we had to validate every train on the network where as there would be an operation, both as a two car, a three car, a four car, a six car. Um, so we a lot of that work was done at night. There were some very, very tired people at the end. And if you go back and do a lessons learned, that is the one thing you would start a lot earlier. Um, so there's, you can see the ASDO system at Mylamoid and then the validation of PTI testing team at Sheffield. And ASDO is, um, I remember sitting with Gary Tremble one day and he explaining ASDO to me. So ASDO basically knows at, at most stations exactly what to do because there's two platforms. 
when you get to what they call complicated stations like Sheffield or Doncaster, where the train can go into any platform, the driver has to um, actually, as he's coming to the station, press, press the TCMS screen to confirm which platform he's going into. And all those processes were all completely new to, uh, to us. Um, and we've had loads of problems with ASDO, and we'll talk about, you know, where we are now with ASDO. But, um, you know, that, that really was a massive piece of work. And that was probably the one piece of work where we, we, we did end up more or less at, um, at, at right at the end, <laughs> doing the last bit in the last week, uh, going up to December. And we're still PTI testing. We've recently done the Penniston line. We've done the uh, Atherton line and we've done the Harrogate line with the 195. So, you know, in the future, and we've, we're putting a challenge into the business to run these trains more. Unfortunately, at the moment, we're not for obvious reasons, but in the future, it allows us to run these trains, you know, when we get disruption, wanting to move trains back to the main locations or the main depots, you know, so, that, so as the validation was a big piece of work. So all that uh, led to the grand launch of the 195 and the 331 trains in July 2019. And then we introduced more trains into the network in September, December and February 2020. Um, so you can see there, it was such a big thing for us that we actually ran a, a staff special to Blackpool uh, from Preston that was just to, before we did any of the sort of big press launches. Uh, we've now carried over 10 million customer journeys and obviously we would have carried a lot more um, if it hadn't been for the last 12 months, you know, when you're running around 12% 12, 12 of your capacity. Um, but great, you know, great. I and mean, you can see on the right there, for those that remember, we had all the grief over the lakes lines when we had to withdraw some of the services because of the, the Bolton corridor situation. You know, Tim Farron there, who's the MP, you know, personally arranged for a set of stock and class 47s to run the trains. You know, this was a big thing for us to actually gain recognition and gain support from the stakeholders. And it's allowed us to really grow in the last 12 months as Northern um, in, into, into how we work and operate these trains. So how do we work with CAF? Um, you know, we, we, whilst we were moving towards introduction of the fleet in the back end of um, 2018, we said we need to create a really strong working relationship sorry, the back end of 2019 with, with CAF at the local depot. So we have three teams from CAF at um, Allerton at Newton Heath. And then we had to create a, create a third team at Neville Hill for the, the 12 3314s because originally they were going to be maintained at Allerton and there was going to be some overhead line between Manchester and Leeds, which obviously there isn't now. So uh, we had to create a separate team and a separate VMI over there. So we've been work, we set the working relationship with CAF. We had a, what we called the working arrangement document, which identified all the key relationships between the production staff on the ground where we were doing the maintenance, the tech support, the warranty support, the supply chain, the performance of the fleet, how we're going to manage safety issues, you know, safety forum, technical forums were all created with leads um, and ever to involved with most of those. Uh, and we now have a TSSA board. Uh, as now we run down the manufacturing contract, we're now got a very strong TSSA board structure process, which, um, so you can see some of the, you know, we, every week we go, we have a SWOT analysis and we go through the issues that we've had. So you can see in there the management of coronavirus. So that was a huge challenge. Um, these guys, about 70% of the CAF fleet are Spanish. Um, coronavirus happened, they couldn't go home. Um, they couldn't, you know, the rest of us were going home or, or, you know, the guys on the depot that were working throughout the pandemic were going home to see their families. These guys couldn't see their families. So we had a, a big responsibility as, as within the team to look after these guys and make sure they're okay. The project manager arrived the week before the lock, first lockdown from Boston to start his new role. And he was basically locked in a hotel in Mountain Guy and he just, he, he, you know, we, we just helped. We had to carry on working together. So you can see some of the achievements we've had in there, uh, some of the challenges we've had um, on the 195 fleet, but we've had some issues with cab doors that, um, you know, like everything else, you sign off the design and then you find things as you're going along. Um, we had issues with the power pack radiator cleaning, um, which we're now learning from, which caused uh, trip outs, which I'll come back to later. Uh, we've done loads of software upgrades, uh, uh, compressors, holding brake. We had a big issue in the early days with the units asking for a brake testing service because KBRS had written into their software that it had to have a 24 hour brake test. And it was written as a category A fault. So basically the driver had to stop the train and do a brake test. Um, we've now managed that better. And uh, uh, we, you know, it's again, one of these things, you know, we never used to say to guys coming off places like Sheffield, you've got to do a brake test, you do a door test, but 
you, you know, you're not told any docket to the brake test. So a lot of stuff we learned from that. Big issue on the 195s is the alternators. We had a lot of very early failures of the alternators. We had to do, we had to go through a process of proving it was the alternator and not the train. So we rigged up a train with MTU and with um, Genoptic and we proved it was down to the design and the build of the alternator. So we now have a, a an alternative alternator coming over. We've had some flywheel issues on the engines, which were known about from the 172s, um, <clears throat> various other bits and pieces. And the usual challenge around managing vehicles and mods. And one of the things we did do at the start of the pandemic was really focus on getting the mods and campaigns done because obviously we had vehicles spare because we weren't running the full timetable. So that's been a big help to us over the last year. So going back to Newton Heath uh, and, and, the, and the steam shed um, in, the, in the contract, uh, there was no provision to do any work at Newton Heath apart from some fairly minor upgrades. So uh, one of the first things that Ben did, he said, we need to build a new facility. So if you go past Newton Heath now and on the Rochdale line, you will see on your right as you're leaving Manchester, a completely brand new maintenance facility for the 195 fleet, which is opening this week. There's been a few challenges there, but it has the ability to drop all three engines or two engines at the same time. The guys can work safely. They can work at, uh, you know, we were having to do things in the old shed where if we wanted to change oils, we had to move the unit to another location. Um, you can do everything in place. You can work on the roofs. Obviously, all the air conditioning units are on the roofs. You know, this is going to be real state of the art. It's, it's going to be co-located with the cells and calf. We'll have a control room there. Um, we'll do all our heavy maintenance there. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll change bogies. We'll change air con units. We'll change engines. So uh, we've just recently started the midlife engine regime. Um, and and we're, we're now, you know, we're now going to be doing that here. Uh, we've done we've had to do the first ones at Allerton because of this we've now got a brand new maintenance facility which everybody's very proud of and and if you go on to come and visit the site in the future you're most welcome to or we'll have one of your site days there and we can show you uh, we can show you around a facility um it, it, you know and it wasn't budgeted for and to give rail north partnership their, their recognition they they helped us go through the, the the machinations of actually gaining the funding to do this work we let the contract, we manage the contract. Sometimes you say, was that the right thing? Perhaps you let these things go to network rail. We're not experts in building building buildings like this, um, but we've got there in the end and um, all been well in the next couple of weeks. We've, we have had a train in there. We've had a couple of trains in there to test the facilities. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we've now got a brand new facility to maintain the trains with modern technology that you need to run the train that this train is. So, um, what we're doing next, um, we, we have four real areas that we're working on. So, you, you know, anybody that's managed new trains, mods and campaigns. So the four main issues we've got is the cab doors, which we've got a new arrangement on alternators, the radiator cleaning regime. We've had some issues with saloon heaters tripping out. So we're doing some work with that. Uh, this is primarily on the 105s. Technical performance improvements. We've got a, a CAF, I've got a reliability plan that's a, a glide path in terms of reliability over the next 18 months. We'll focus CAF towards um, software improvements. On these trains, you don't you don't you don't do a lot of improvements with the bogies. You you focus very much on software, and I'll show you something in a minute. We focus towards Northern's additional service requirements. So as we grow the timetable back from May, um, you know we're currently running on around seventy percent of the timetable. We go to eighty five percent. We really you know we need to be careful because we have had that luxury of hot spares and all the other things recently. But certainly, um, we know we need to focus on, on Northern's additional service requirements. And I mentioned the engine half-life overhaul process, which we're now challenging that to 9,000 hours using the support we've been able to, to drive that through. Um, which goes back to Russell was involved with the engines at GNER and the engines with the MTU. So again, you know, bringing the right people into the team to, uh, to really focus on what we're doing. Commercial. So you can get into a real pickle as anybody who's done commercial stuff with these types of contracts. And we've been right through the MSA contract into the Trade Triple SA, there is a word called reasonable. And we've tried to be as reasonable as we can with CAF. And, and whether it's, you know, safety, NIRs, focus of support, changing the way the CAF resource is based, how they work and operate. You know, we've managed to get some additional posts into the CAF teams. 
we had a big challenge with OEM training because the majority of this equipment on this train is, is built in Europe. So during the pandemic, we couldn't bring over. We had some great experience trying to get Merrick in Spain to do the, the aircon training over, over teams, which just didn't work in the end. So luckily they're a KB company and we, we, we did that within the UK. And we're moving towards full fleet final acceptance, which will be achieved in summer 2021. So from, from five years of building them, we'll have achieved full fleet acceptance by this summer. But one of the big things is working with the operational teams. You know, these trains were absolutely totally new for us. We had incidents in the early days where the drivers that were so used to just getting to a station, taking the key out, walking off the train, we couldn't do that anymore. We had a big issue at Leeds Station in the first week where all the passengers were on the train because the ASDO hadn't been configured properly, so they couldn't let the passengers off the train. You know, we've, we, we've got a really strong relationship with the regional teams. We've been out there doing, um, we, we have something called the regional control meetings. We've been out there doing improvement ops, feminization sessions, Blackpool, Barrow, Sheffield, Leeds. Even during the pandemic, we were doing them. And really, you know, with DTMs and CTMs and talking to the train crew, we're starting up Ops Roadshow. We're, the outstations, like everything else, as I said earlier, have been forgotten about. So we, we retained a couple of the CAF commissioning guys and a guy called Matt Newell's been out working with our people and really increasing their functions. Maintenance control for middleization. You know, everybody can, everybody forgets about the maintenance control, but you know, from my background, that was extremely key. So, we've got a couple of champions within maintenance control, particularly a guy called Ben Seddon in Manchester, who really has taken on, created their own ways of understanding the issues because these trains were completely new to people. You know, telling somebody to press a button to reset a train, you didn't do that on any other train. You just, you, you did, a, you raised the EBS and off you went. And we've done a lot of work with the cons team to look at how we improve the communications uh, in, into the uh, into the uh, into the business. So we're not sat, you know, we're just not an engineering team sat in engineering. We're working with CAF, we're working with Evershot, we're working with the ops guys, you know, to, to actually drive us forward. So how have we done all that effort? So um, you can see the 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 M tin, and this is suppressed by the mileages. So you can see uh, six months ago, the fleets were doing around 6,000 miles of failure. And we're currently doing nearly 15,000 miles of failure. Um, big thing in our software, and I'll come back to that. But we just had, uh, I mean, the 105s are now doing, you know, the, when we won the um, Golden Spanner last year, Roger Ford sarcastically said that nobody's ever won a Golden Spanner at 4,000 miles and empty. Well, you've eaten your words, Roger, we're now at 12, we're now at 15,000 miles on, on a, on a 195 and we're actually at um, 25,000 on a 331. This period we did 58,000 miles on the East region, 3314s. So, you know, there's an absolute total dedication and ownership of this train to, to make it as good as it can be. Um, final acceptance is a big driver behind that because that increases the, 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 the sort of threshold in terms of the performance regime. And a big thing for us and going back to technology and it's, sorry, it's a bit blurred, is, was the introduction of lead mind. So LeadMind is our RCM system. It gives 25,000 25, lines of data off the train and don't try and use 25,000 lines of data. So I can tell you that from hard experience when I first worked in the control and I got 27 emails in the first 10 minutes telling me that trains were faulty. So <clears throat> we've rolled LeadMind out. Young lad called Dominic Porton and Andy Gordon in the team uh, really sort of evolving LeadMind, getting us stuck into some of the issues around the power packs and telling us where trains were starting to get warm. You know, looking at heat, heat maps and wheel slip conditions that we had, you know, we had quite a challenging autumn last year, uh, particularly on the Calder Valley and, and using that to work with Network Rail. Uh, we've used it to, to manage overhead line incidents. Um, um, you know, Davenport was a good example. So, you know, as the, one of the maintenance controllers said to me a couple of weeks ago, you know, if you take lead mine off me now, it'd be like you're taking my right arm away. So from having a lot of resistance two years ago, you know, somebody once said to me, well, how will these technology help us manage incidents? You know, but a big piece behind that growth was software. So we sorted the ASDO software out. We had a big issue with um, the, the, the sort of ethernet backbound and the switches, they were losing data. We sorted that out. We sorted out the PIS software. We sorted out the, the compressor software, the brake test software. So a lot of that growth is actually due to uh, software upgrades and things that we've done on the train. So, to finish off, uh, are you proud to be Northern? We certainly are um, as a team. Um, we've created a train that everybody's really passionate about. It's got challenges still, but we're really working in the right direction. And as I said earlier, um, software, you know, if you'd have said to me two years ago that we'd have been using ASDO 
Uh, we we did a live live ASDO demonstration over Leadmine a couple of weeks ago, and the feedback was wow. You know, to have that kind of technology in the business, um, you know, we, we wouldn't have had that a few years ago. So um, that's it. Thanks. Um, that's it for me. Um, the guy on the, the other side for me is Gary Barty. He was an engineering supervisor. Uh, he's now, you know, he's learned how to commission trains. Um, you know, so uh, Sam Taylor and people like this. And, and I think finally the word for Gary Tremble is we've got a train that we are proud of. And, um, you know, okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. That's terrific. Well done. I'm sure lots of people have learned a lot that they didn't know prior to, to this evening. And I'm sure a lot of other people will have been reminded of things that they'd forgotten. So I, I, you, you covered a huge, huge range of ground. So now we've got uh, a period of time for questions up until eight o'clock. I think we'll, we'll call halt eight o'clock and then move to the, um, the after party. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to either pop it into the chat box um, or alternatively, if you've got, um, if you're not, not so happy typing, there's the opportunity to use the um, reactions tools. I think Zoom has, um, if you've got different sorts of computers, display Zoom differently. So I'm afraid you're gonna to have to learn for yourself what you've got, but the easiest way is to find out, to move your mouse towards the bottom of the screen and a, and a toolbar will appear. You've then got, uh, if you click on participants, you should then see some buttons, colored buttons appearing just below the list of participants, to, which allow you to select some kind of reaction. Or in other cases, there's a, a whole toolbar which will appear in the bottom right of your screen with the words reactions. And you can clap, you can cheer, you can wave your hands, you can do whatever, but use one or other of those tools to catch my attention or Gareth's attention and I'll keep flicking through the screens. So if you want to turn your cameras on as well, that will help. And we should be able to ask some uh, some excellent questions to, to match the, the excellent uh, lecture that Andy's just given. So I've picked out a few. Um, and I guess we can start with one. I'm, I'm sure not everybody will have been following the responses that have been going into the chat whilst we've been listening to Andy. So probably best if we recap on those questions that have already been um, put in the box and, and answered, and then people can have a chance to think of, of questions as we go. So, um, Gareth, do you want to pick out a, a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. I see Gary Kane has done a really good job of helping you by answering a lot of the questions. Yes, yes, you're quite right. Does he? <laughs> yeah, yeah he was on. A job. Thanks, Gary. I'll send you the check. <laughs> <laughs> um, it'd be great to go to... Um, Malcolm, you've got a few questions, but could you just start with your one about the gauging? Malcolm's about. Uh, yeah, it's all right. It just took me a moment to find where to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I, I was I was struck by the number of infringements uh, and that your comment that you managed to uh, argue many of them away. It, it, it did make me wonder whether uh, the hundred and forty something that uh, needed adjustment actually in practice really did need adjustments or when you ran when you actually ran the train there you found there was loads of room um oh, that's a very good question i think i think what we found was and, and you've got to remember that you're operating over a network that's had in the, in the majority of cases no new trains for many years um you know we found um some issues with the process of when you were doing work on trains uh, on um, routes how that was being picked up and readjusted you know the platform surroundings were being adjusted the um the track layouts were being adjusted and i think i see recently the clear route, clear route have announced the new system and that certainly a lot of that came out of the feedback we gave to them at the time so a lot of it was you know um you know, you, you're dealing in a lot of cases with 18th, 19th century infrastructure where you're trying to run new trains. So that's that's what the challenge was in a lot of them. Did that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very yeah. much. 
just building on that, if I, if I may, Andy, there was um, one of the guys from Network Rails Gauging team did a presentation to the Glasgow PWI a few weeks ago where they've been challenged to um, reinstate the, oh, sorry, that's not fair, to ensure that the Scottish network can take all of the, the kinds of trains that have been used on it since 1994, plus all of the freights, if I remember correctly. So they've had to do um, re-examine their gauging from first principles. Um, did sort of the, the new kinds of, of bogies and, and um, other things that come along with a brand new train, was that a challenge for the, for the infrastructure gauging folks to, to grasp or did you find that they just picked, took, took to like a duck to water? I think they picked it up in the main. You've got the challenge with the gauging team and the route clearance teams is it's a very small group of individuals um, at the time, uh, the guys in Milton Keynes. And the biggest challenge there was was engaging with them and then managing their workload. Because if you think about it, you know, we were going into this at the same time as Caledonian Sleeper, um, East uh, Greater Anglia with the Stadler trains. Um, so there was a lot of workload there. And it's, it's, a, it's a field that I think from my personal sort of listening to people. I wasn't directly involved with it at the time, but um, you know, there is a very, it's one of these specialist knowledge expert fields within the railway industry that suddenly got a lot of pressure put on it in a very short period of time. Um, so, um, and I think the biggest thing here is to actually involve the local teams. Um, so the knowledge that you've got out there with the, the sort of mobile operations managers and, and people like that um, helped us to get through some of these issues. So what, what, on, what at Milton Keynes looked like a, a no, once you got talking to the local teams, was a yes. So creating that relationship between the two was very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Who else have we got, Gareth? We've got one here from John Carr. you got a question about software. Was that the RCM software or still there? It was about the, the on-train software. What what I was wondering about was whether Northern themselves do the uh, software mods or whether it's all sent back to CAF. Um, and if so, you know, what happens over the life of the trade? Do you envisage that you'd need to develop your own software skills in Northern? So um, ironically, so so the software updates have all been undertaken by CAF and the main Gary Kane did might. Um, be able to establish that but certainly sort of ASDO, PIS uh, uh, all the stuff on the TCMS screens uh, the brake test was all done by CAF it was all done following so the engineering change process that you would normally use for bogey was also done to follow the software change so no software change was done before it was all signed off it was signed off as a trial first on, on a unit which was done together and then it was rolled out using the CAF text um, at the moment um, the CAF are the design authority for this train. Um, at some point, we will have to um, improve our knowledge of the software within the business. Um, and that's why we've retained some of the commissioning guys as well. Uh, but we've just introduced a new role of on-train systems manager, um, guy called Mark Silverwood, who would basically be managing all the on-train systems going forward, making sure that we've got a very tight uh, change process and I can see us certainly, um, you know, there's a technical spare support contract with CAF till 2025. I can certainly see us over the next few years still using CAF to undertake that work. But the two fleet engineers who work for Gary Kane, they're, they've been heavily involved in the uh, in these changes. So again, you know, where the fleet engineer in the past was probably worrying around the engines and bogies, the new guys are, talk, are worrying around ASDO and PIS. So, you know, and, and it's got an onboard um, uh HABD system as well, which has been quite uh, temperamental on some units. Um, so, uh, you know, it, all these things are uh, have been brought into testers and, and we need to change our thinking about, you know, how we go forward in terms of maintenance going forward. So, no, it, we'll, we will, we'll be relying on CAF in the near future, but we'll, 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 we're heavily involved. Mm, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's a long-term thing you've got here. It's not just a... Um, throw away last year for you a few moments and then it's gone so you, you, your long-term approach has to be adopted at some stage gary gary you might want to say something i didn't know just, just one, mate. yeah no it's just just to back <laughs> on that one yeah it's 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 a big move for northern from from a very 
mechanically focused fleet engineer to a, to effectively what becomes a digital engineer. So we're having to adapt and mold as we go along. Uh, I've got, I'm lucky that I've got two very good fleet engineers that work for me um, and are becoming more and more adept to, to software. Um, but like Andy says, the, the actual software development, um, we can um, ask or request um, for changes from CAF, but it, the, the development comes from CAF or sub suppliers at the moment. Uh, it'll go on that way for a while while we uh, become more uh, or fear with the systems. CAF have a, in Manchester, they have a, a back office team of people that support all their fleets in the UK. Um, and obviously, you know, I, you wind the guys up at West Midlands because they're going to benefit from a lot of the work that we've done over the last three years um, in terms of their software. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Gary. You can mark me out to 10 later. That's all right. I get, I get, the other thing is across across the, the, the Civity platform, as it's known, um, when we make changes, um, the changes we make will can and will benefit um, a lot of other rolling stock across the UK. So like your 196s, your 197s, your 397s, your Caledonian sleepers, um, and, and t the TP rolling stock. So... Um, uh, we're, we're accumulating the most mileage at the moment, so we're, we're effectively the guinea pigs in a sense. Um, so when we make a change, the change can benefit the industry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've created a CAF user group with, with the RDG now, so we have a three-monthly meeting. I am the chair at the moment um, with, with all the operators that are coming up, plus the established ones, TPE and Caledonia Sleeper. So there's a good sharing of information now. I think you hit on a very important point as well, Andrew. Oh, that, um, as as vehicles, trains become more software controlled, um, the control and the safety validation of the software becomes ever more important. Absolutely. Oh. So, so that's that's why we made a decision to follow our engineering change process, which is a, say part of the SMS. Um, yeah. It's a big change for people. You know, you as I say, as Gary said, you used to doing changes to bogies and wheels, and now you're doing changes to software. Yeah. Again, if, if anybody says to me in the future, what was, what was the first thing you would do again? And I always remember Jerry McFadden saying this to me after his experience with, with, um, with Siemens with the 700s, get your software strategy right at the start. Yeah. Do your, do your ta tabletop exercises, understand how you're going to manage change to software. Because if you don't, um, you, you can end up in a real sticky situation. Yeah, to, to put some sort of numbers behind it, Andy, um, so far, uh, up to date, uh, we have, as a business, we have done uh, 258 engineering changes since introduction. Well, since the engineering change uh, process was brought in for 195 and 331. Um, of those 258, uh, I would say at least three quarters to maybe 85% of those are software. There's very few that are actually mechanical changes to the train. Yeah. So it's, it's very, it's, it's quite a labor intensive task, but it's one that's obviously needed and uh, for, obviously for, for, for many, many safety critical systems. And then, and then you've got the, the individual units and then configuration across the fleet to, to manage on top of that. Yeah, yeah. The, the list of change or the, or the actual configuration is something that's, that's held very close to Northern and CAF. Um, and it's, it's almost, it, it's tre is a, a very um, high profile piece of information. Um, it, it basically it, it gives us Northern and CAF and Eversholt, the owners, a, a, an understanding of what level the train's at, where it was, when it was changed. Um, so it, it's, it's traceability, which is the main thing. So one of the challenges on performance is that the 195s tend to, fall, tend to be two to three a period behind the 331s because particularly with compatibility and coupling and everything else and the way the 195s operate, the, we, we do a lot more splitting of sets on the 195s. And so we couldn't just roll out software onto a, a train. We had to manage it very, and we had a few scary moments, but you, you had to manage that process. Right. Steve Hotha, do you want to ask your question about the CAF support? You should be able to just unmute yourself. Can you see the little icon that lets you do that? Right. Yeah. So we got that. Just wanted to be clear. You've obviously got to good working relationship with CAF now, but trains normally have 25, 30, 35 years life. What commitment do CAF have? You know, if you want to put them on different routes and you want to change your platform system, your ASDO or anything else, what contractual commitment do CAF have to support you 
you know, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. To CAFA, the design authority for this train. So uh, you, to whoever shall, we, if we want to make any changes, we have to agree that to our current fan, our current lease, which is up to 2025. Um, CAF have a TSSA technical support contract in place till then. So that's uh, not long in training. No, no, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Sorry. So, um, you know, the, the CAF, and that's going to be our biggest decision that we have to make in, as we move into the next franchise or the next working arrangement, whatever it's going to be, is how, how what, what can we rely on ourselves and what can we rely on CAF on? And I think the fact that CAF are the design authority, this train will have to have a very strong relationship with CAF through its life. Um, and I think that's where, so if you look at the 170s now, Bombardier are still the design authority for the 170s, but there's been so many changes made to them over the years. It's very difficult sometimes to get support on some of the on-train systems. So things like Orbiter on the 170s, which doesn't work for us, that's, that's, just, that's showing you where it can go wrong. So um, we need to, it's, it's a very, it, it changes the way that you work with these manufacturers going forward. You've got to have a very strong relationship with them. Thanks. Hmm. Um, David Kay, I think you've you've used the reaction buttons to indicate you'd like to ask a question. Would you like to, to do so? You'll need to unmute yourself as well. Where's David? David Kay. No. Okay, we'll come back to, to David in a moment. Um, there's a couple of, oh, a number of other questions that come in. They're all, all been good. Um, Ian Moore asked a, a question early on, which I'm sure Andy won't have picked up on about um, signal sighting. Ian, do you want to, to put that one to Andy and, and build on it? Or is Ian gone? I can answer that one. Yeah, right, I think I think I answered that one in the chat, but I'm yeah. happy to answer any more questions on it. Gary, you go, because I'm probably yeah, going to say you, you go. No, no, I've got Andy. I'm not. I would steal if they're going, Andy. I wasn't direct. I was going to say I wasn't directly involved, but it's like everything else. It's but there's part of the network change process. We had to do all the go through all the signal sighting committees. Um, yeah. You know, and, and and you know when we were running the trains and getting route clearance as we as we built up the SOC, um, we had to go through that process and work closely with Network Rail to to manage signal sighting. Is that is that yeah, that right? Yeah, it is part of the project. Um, we we uh, effectively purchased um, a piece of work from Network Rail, uh, and we flew a, a Network Rail sighting specialist out to Zaragoza to the factory where we conducted signal sighting. Um, from the driver's seat and the second person seat uh, at the factory in Zaragoza. Uh, that was around about 2017. And that was done with it in conjunction with um, Aslef. So there was there was uh, everything everything was out on the open on the table. Quite an expensive piece of work, but it was well worth doing. Hmm. Very proactive. Good luck. Ah, uh, the the. <laughs> Sorry, Ian's just added the train might be compliant, but the infrastructure might not be. He's having some browser problems, so hence that's, that's why he didn't ask the, ask the question. Uh, I, okay. think, I think that's you know we've had instant, we've had issues over the last um, few years, infrastructure related, which you know we've sat with the uh, we have the, uh, the the network rail partnership board to Northern. Uh, we have the regional control rooms with the regional network rail guys. You know we've worked through them proactively and, and dealt with it through those routes so yeah. that's the whole point of having partnerships isn't it so yeah you know very much so uh there's a couple of questions coming in about uh, the people side of of things um and i'll join the two of them together if if, if that's okay um so mick james has asked do you think you could have done some things better in, in involving the, the, the people in, in the process? Uh, and uh, da, 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 second one, um, the driver's reaction to, to the new cabs and uh, the sort of historic musculoskeletal uh, injury side of things. Do you think you did some things 
mm. in a more exaggerated fashion with the drivers than than you actually managed to do so or, or sorry than you would have wanted to do so or would you think you got the level about right with with the drivers from the, from the word go so the first question um around involving people i mean it was a huge challenge you, you know you you see the size of the northern network and you're basically running these trains uh, from york to uh to blackpool to barrow to nottingham to uh, you know to, to liverpool um but, you know you i think if you go we've done a lessons learned exercise actually with with our guys that were involved in the project and we cap and ever shot but we're going to do another one with our own people and i think yes you we would have involved some of the regional teams earlier um and it's that huge challenge between you know we had a we have a you know a very strong project team and then you've got regional teams who um you've you know you have to work with earlier on and you've got to remember two years ago we had a lot of um, relationship issues with the northern with all the sort of things that were going on so a lot of people were focused on reworking timetables every weekend going out and working trains to, as conductors and you know that that um, that that put a lot of pressure on people and um you know i think i think one of the lessons learned is about how we involve more people earlier on is a good answer uh, on the, the 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 cab setup gary might know more but i know certainly from the the, the other trains we 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 had a lady within the business Anne, who was a, a specialist in all the ergonomics and um, i can't remember whether we used an external specialist on this fleet or internal but we we certainly used Anne on on other fleets to to manage the the challenge around um you know the ergonomics and get those signed off with the uh, you know one of the things we did with the asset as the safety reps was to manage health and safety reps was to manage off the, the ergonomics um from, it's, a, it's, from a very early stage we used um we, we, uh, Northern put together a, um, a cab user group, uh, basically formed of uh, Asla for an RMT. Um, but we also used our own occupational nurse, as, as Andy explained. But we also, we also went external as well with the human factors assessment. So the cab was signed off ergonomically um, through a third party verification. Um, but it, I, I, for, for me, it was, it was if you're going to do anything with a new train introduction, um, as a lesson learned, what Northern did in terms of, of, of cab development um, from a very early age uh, or an early point in design, um, that would be something to definitely, definitely take forward again because it was, it was for me, it was the cab is a, a success. I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the cab in its current form. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a, a good experience all around. Absolutely. Good. <coughs> Do you think you might have made a bit more use of things like virtual reality or augmented reality, or was that just not necessary? I wish we'd have some um, simulators. Yeah, mm -hmm. simulators, definitely. Um, um, cab mock-up, uh, Andy explained earlier in the presentation that Northern uh, built a cab mock-up. That was never originally in the contract. Um, it was something CAF very kindly uh, agreed to do. Um, and that, that cab mock-up went all over Spain <laughs> for a, and then it ended up in, where, where is it now, Andy Scunthorpe? Oh, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it went from Zaragoza to Barcelona, back to Zaragoza, and then Zaragoza back to Sunny Scunthorpe. So, yeah, the, the, the mock-up was incredibly useful. Um, but like, as Andy says, simulators would have been the golden ticket. Hmm. Yep. So you so you look at you look at the experience the EMR were going through now, and obviously Paul Barnfield moved to EMR from Northern. They they're using simulators on their designing of their new trains. So I think that's probably one area that we would have, you know, it was an individual contract. It, they are a lot, as we all know. I think that's one area that um, and, and LNER have used them for the Zuma training. You know, that's one area we would have invested in, definitely. Mm. Oh, good lesson to learn, I think, for any new fleet. Uh, acquisition. Gareth, have you got any more questions that uh, we think we should pick out? Because we're just over our, our eight o'clock. Is there any that sort of stand out as leaping or should we save them for the for the after party? I think we can probably save them to Caro for the after party. Um, right. yeah. Good. Thank you. Right. So in which case it's time to do the vote of thanks. Uh, if I could call upon Nigel Yule to do that. Nigel, don't forget you need to unmute yourself and, and turn your camera on there. There you are. Just need to unmute yourself. That's it. Well done. Thank you. Oh, pardon me. Um, Andy, thanks for a great talk. Um, 
our paths have crossed many over many years. Uh, I remember that um, great intercity project that went nowhere in the end because privatisation came out in the way and called the Added Value Initiative. You remember that, Andy? Yes, <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> many, many, many a hotel bill and goodness knows what was spent on that project and uh, working with some great characters. Um, yeah. But yeah, you've, you, you've covered well and, and, and the discussion on gauging has been very, very, very interesting. Um, I, I recall um, some work I ended up doing um, with, with HSTs because I've ended up when East Midlands trains used to like lots running lots of charity charters to places where HSTs hadn't been before. And uh, I remember yes, the yes. branch, which Great Western had tried to go down there the previous year and Network Rail had looked at, at the gauging information that had come up from the railway and they said, no way, it can't, doesn't fit. And um, we went down with the assistance of Southwest Trains uh, a small team, I think, in fact, Paul Barnfield might have been one of them, um, where they went and validated their data, handed it over to me, and we proved the train fitted. And uh, that, that summer, we uh, had a very long day taking a she HST from Sheffield to yeah. Swanage and back, with three hours in Swanage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, yeah, it was a good old day, and... Uh, I do remember, as part of it, we, we, we even tricked lots of people that Southwest Trains operated HSTs by putting Southwest Trains on the side of half of it. So, uh, yeah, it was it was interesting the way you talk, you, you've had with gauging in the fact that network rails still don't really know where anything is. Um, so, yeah, you've covered the real difficulty. Well, uh, probably more complex than ever these days in introducing a new train. Um, and I think you've done it really well. It was good to hear a bit about your previous career. Um, and I think can uh, everyone join me in thanking Andy for an excellent presentation. Well done. Thank you very Thank much, you. everyone. I'll add my, my thanks to you, Andy, and, and to Gary as well for stepping in and, and supporting on the questions so eloquently at the end. So a couple of adverts just quickly from, from me. We've got uh, next talks coming up from the Northeast Centre and the Northwestern Centre. So we've got in the month uh, 13th of April, so that's a couple of weeks, uh, Felix Schmidt will be talking about the J Japan model versus the UK model. Um, Felix, I'm sure, will be as entertaining as he always is and have a few interesting and controversial things to say. And our next presentation in the Northeastern Centre will be, um, and, and that's actually in the CAF factory, that's uh, one of the Mark V body shells. David Tooley will be talking about uh, advances in coaching stock design uh, over the last 70 years. So. Uh, I'm sure that will be interesting as well. Same booking means as you use to get to this talk for, for that one uh, in three weeks' time. So at which point I will stop the recording. <laughs>